Hi, Minister. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for coming into studio. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vashi, and hello to everyone. I, I wanted to start off by asking you a, a question in your new capacity as Quebec's uh, lieutenant for, for the Liberals. Should Canadians, and especially Quebecers, interpret Mr. Rodriguez's decision to sit as an independent going forward as a repudiation of your party's federal ban brand pardon me, in Quebec? No, because he's leaving with the same passion and the same values that he has defended and lived on in the last 20 years. Mr. Rodriguez has spent 20 years of his life, you know, with all the sacrifices that we know come with that, you know, serving Canadians and Quebecers in the federal government. Now he's going back to where he came from 20 years ago, which is from the Quebec Liberal Party. And I do understand the decision to resign from his post to run for that position, but he additionally made a decision to sit as an independent. And my question is whether Quebecers and Canadians should interpret that particular aspect of his decision as a repudiation of your party's federal brand in Quebec. Does he want to create so much distance, which it seemed to me through his comments this week, between what he's doing and what your party is doing at the federal level? No, my understanding is that he's doing that you know, to be able to make himself more freely uh, able to speak to, to Quebecers. You know, he doesn't want to be sitting in, in our caucus, in our liberal caucus. He doesn't need to be obliged to, you know, to, to follow all the caucus discipline that comes with being a liberal MP. He also but wants- But doesn't that mean that he doesn't want to defend the ideas and the things that your, your party is doing at the federal level? I believe he will always defend the liberal values at all levels of, of government, but he needs some more freedom now to do that, uh, given that he wants to spend his time and his considerable abilities in the service of Quebecers within the provincial government. If that, in your view, is not a repudiation of, of your party's brand in Quebec, is the by-election result uh, the one where your party went from you know, having a 20-point margin of victory in the last general election to losing to the Bloc Québécois, is that not a repudiation of the liberal in Quebec? Well, the by-election result, as you imply, wasn't good news for, for us, and certainly not the, the thing that loads of volunteers gave their time for up to, uh, up to last Monday. So it was, a, it was a shock. It was very sad for those volunteers to see the, the result, and we obviously have a lot of gratitude for the work they did. Now, the, the important thing with, with such a, a result is to take the lessons, not to see what were the, uh, the, the reasons for that outcome. We still have to do a little, little more, a little more work to understand that fully. But I can tell you briefly, Vashi, that is true in Canada and elsewhere in the world that people often feel unsatisfied with where they are in life. However, having campaigned in, in La Salle, Verdun, Emma, I heard very little dissatisfaction with the policies that we're putting into place to help grow the economy, to support the middle class, fight against climate change, and all the things that people in general very strongly support. I guess I interpret, though, your comments as absolving your government of any culpability for the way in which Canadians feel about, as you describe it, what they're enduring, what the world is enduring. And that's not to say your government is responsible for the wars or for climate change or any of those things. But I do think that there are, and public opinion has borne this out, along with the by-election in Montreal and the by-election in Toronto, a growing number of Canadians who do hold your government responsible, at least in part, for the challenges that they're facing right now. Why is your government not willing to take responsibility for any of that? Well, we were taking responsibility for the things that we need to do. And as you said, there are many things we can't really do a lot more to help, like the climate crisis is a global crisis. You mentioned that now the war, the wars that we're seeing, we're putting every possible effort to support Ukraine, to support a peace and, and, and ceasefire agreement in, in the Palestine and with, with Israel. So we're doing all we can, but there are things that obviously requires the work of other uh, players in, in the world. But I think affordability challenges with great respect, Minister, are different, right? Grocery prices, inflation. I know that the, the overall rate of inflation is increasing at a much smaller rate there, or, or slower rate than it was previously. But Canadians, by and large, I think, communicated to your government that they felt you came to the table much too late when it came to housing. Even in uh, Verdun, for example, where such a large portion of the population is full of renters, 
the, the actions that your government eventually took on housing almost felt two years too late. Let me come back to housing in a moment, but you're right, inflation is now at 2%. And Canada was the first to decrease low interest rates across all developed economies. It's the first to decrease interest rates, interest rates a second time and the first to decrease interest rates a third time. And because that's because we did the right thing in Canada. The Bank of Canada also did its job to bring inflation down to the right level. Now, when it comes to housing, Pierre Poilier, when he was minister responsible for housing, built a total of six affordable apartments during his entire mandate across the entire country. We've been building tens of thousands of affordable social housing homes in the last years, and there's much Res more to respectfully, come. Respectfully, there's three million more that need to be built, and that's been identified for a long time, well before your government actually came to the table with a plan to address that issue. But that's not going to come with the insults and the cuts that Pierre Poliev is pushing forward. He insults everyone, including municipalities in my province, Ashi. Now, how can he build a relationship with Quebec mayors when he insults them at every possible opportunity? And, and look, I, I think you're correct to point out there are gaps in the Conservatives housing plan, there are gaps in other plans they put forward, there are hard questions that they deserve. That's my job to direct those questions to them and, and to make sure Canadians are aware of what they do and don't present. But I'm also supposed to be asking you questions about what you're doing and what you're not doing. And, and if every time I ask a minister, you know, does your government hold any responsibility for this or was your plan too late? What are you going to do to, to course correct? They just point to the Conservatives. That's not helpful to Canadians either. No, and that's why, that's, that's correct. No. At some point, there will be a need for people to choose as citizens. The contrast will be needed. There will be two options and we'll have to choose among the two options. You're correct. Now, Budget 2024, just a few months ago, put into place the biggest housing investments in four decades, therefore in a large portion of the Canadian history. That that is changing already the lives of thousands of Canadians and will be impactful for many more in the in the months to come. I think even your housing minister has admitted that that plan will not restore affordability until the next decade. But I, I, I do take your point. I just want to move on because I think there are a lot of people watching also the way in which the dynamics in Parliament have shifted. And in particular, uh, with the Bloc Québécois and the fact that they are supporting your government as, as it faces this confidence vote next week. The one thing the Bloc has asked for uh, very specifically is what's known as royal recommendation. Essentially, your government providing for something that they have specifically asked for to go ahead, just to put it in, in layman's terms. I know it's technical, but in layman's terms. That what they want to do is expand an increase you put in place for pensioners over 75 to old age security, a 10% increase. They want to expand that to pensioners between 65 and 74. When that private member's bill went forward, the Liberals all voted against it. Everyone else voted in favor of it. Is your government going to do that? You're correct. We did that for 75 years and older because when you grow older, the, it costs more, medicine costs more, housing costs more, your income stays relatively constant. So it's more difficult to make, make ends meet when you enter a particular age and roughly 75 was the right age to choose in my, in my, in, in my, in my, uh, my view. Second thing is that we are indeed doing more things for seniors. The dental care plan is going really well. 2.3 million seniors have registered. Pierre Poiliev says the plan doesn't exist, but it does exist because 2.3 million Canadian seniors have registered with, uh, with it. So the third thing is indeed, we'll need to keep working with the, with the NDP and the Bloc in particular to see what more we can do. But my question was specific to what the Bloc is asking for, which is an increase, an expansion of the increase to OAS. Will your government provide royal recommendation for that? As I've said, we'll have conversations with the Bloc. We also need conversations with the NDP because they worked with us to put dental care into place. Now, right, but my question is about OAS. Yes, I know. You don't want to answer it. I'm, no, I'm I cannot it. answer now because I need to have... I'm you just, don't know for sure. I just started sure. yesterday and we, you know, we saw the Ottawa bubble explode, or, you know, bubble in the last few days. So that's, that's obviously something that we need to keep into control, under control, to serve Canadians. You no, know, we don't want the political game, the House of Commons, to distract anyone. It's not going to distract us, certainly. It's from the objectives of serving Canadians every day. But um, let me end quickly with dental. 18 to 64 year old adults will become eligible to dental only in the first half of 2025. Now, if the NDP doesn't work with us, these 4 million adults will not become eligible to dental care. 
That's a serious question which the NDP needs to it answer. It sounds a little, a little bit like a threat to the NDP. Well, it's not a threat. They work with us. Can you not work with, with other parties in order to move that forward? Well, there are many other things to do, but 4 million adults between 18 and 64 will only become eligible in the first six months of 2025. The NDP needs to decide whether these 4 million Canadians deserve dental care. Just very quickly, I, I know that you can't say yes or no at this point, as you indicated on the OAS. Is your government open? Just because you have voted, the Liberals voted against that private member's bill. Is your government open to the possibility of that going forward? As I said, I cannot uh, open any conversation at this time. It's all part of a complex budget process of which I'm not the re only responsible person. Are you in favor of it? I, I, Mr. I, Blanchet says this is for Quebecers. Well, whatever we do for Quebecers is good for Canadians, and whatever we do good for Canadians is also good for, for Quebecers. The significant increase in senior support we've put into place over the last few years that has benefited every possible senior, including many of them in my, in, in my writing. Okay, Minister, I'll leave it on that note. I appreciate making the time. Thank you very much.